Hi, Randy. How you doing, John? Fantastic. It's great to have you here on the June Founder Series, um, where we are highlighting the people, the stories behind the brands that we love. And you can see I love TRX. So Hey, I like what you got there. I really like your core <laughs> and your backdrop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, for the folks that don't know TRX today, um, you should, but we'd love to hear a quick, you know, elevator pitch on what TRX is. Uh, and maybe later in the conversation, we'll do a quick demo. Um, and then also like how you got to building uh, this tool. Sure. Well, um, today, TRX is very different than it was, you know, geez, it's hard to believe, but I think we're, we're coming up on our 18th year in business. So um, it was very different then. Today, TRX is a, you know, one of the leading brands in the fitness industry that specifically focuses on what we call today functional training tools and techniques and methodologies. And people define functional training a lot of different ways, you know, my favorite way to describe it is that you you do exercises in the training room that map to something else that you want to be able to do in life, right? Whether it's sports specific or just general living, you want to be able to bend, reach, lift, carry your kid on your neck, you know, like any of those things, you can program movements that make you stronger, better, and more durable in, in what you what you want to do elsewhere. That's That's one definition. And the other one that I like is, it's small tools, big movements, right? Because when you think back to kind of the more traditional bodybuilding heritage that fitness followed for a long time, you had the opposite of that, right? You had big tools, little small movements, like a great big machine that you get in, lock yourself in and you know train your biceps in this tiny little move. And that's fine for certain applications, namely you know aesthetics and trying to build you know, hypertrophied muscles, but it, it isn't as effective if you want to function as a, as a strong system in the world. And so, you know, well, a combination of both is good. And TRX has become um, the largest brand in functional training that does everything that you would do with a trainer from, we started with a suspension trainer, you know, and, and we've, we've now got sort of every tool that, that a trainer would use with a client from kettlebells to to bands, to ropes, to balls, to plyo boxes, and kind of that whole range. The only thing that we really don't do at TRX is make machines. So we, we generally don't make things that have hinges or tracks. You know, we're, we're small tools, big movements, using a lot of joints in the body and, you know, training body zones rather than individual muscles is kind of the way we think about it. And uh, that's a big jump from where we started. Right, uh, which which you know the inspiration for what would become TRX actually happened all the way back in 1997. What is that now? 20, 23 uh, years ago. Good lord. <laughs> but uh, I was a Navy SEAL for a long time, and I created this crazy harness that uh, that if you want, John, I can go and grab it before we're done here and and show it. But uh, you know the idea was originally inspired by my teammates and I deploying in SEAL units abroad and not having any gear to train with. And yet you're supposed to maintain, you know, a world-class level of fitness. And I came up with this, uh, you know, this, this goofy idea that originally involved a, a jujitsu belt that I'd accidentally put in my, in my deployment gear and uh, about six feet of nylon webbing that we used for the, the harnesses of parachutes. And I came up with this system where you could load it up with your body working against gravity and then do pretty much every every exercise movement that you've ever done in a gym, but just using these straps, your body weight, and gravity. Amazing, amazing. And you know, I know uh, TRX has evolved a lot as a brand, and from a strap or a belt on on the door from the Navy SEAL days to the company that you've built today. What you know, I'm curious as a consumer. I think my dad got me this, and just put it up there and now I like watch a little bit of YouTube videos here and there and uh, just experiment. Um, I love to use it all, honestly for stretching also before bed. But what is the, the ideal customer journey in today's 
today's world. I know you guys also sell to trainers and that's become a big focus and maybe something that we can explore some of the stuff that you guys have done during COVID in terms of the free training and, and that. But then thinking about like the end user, um, they come onto your website, they grab a strap, and I know you guys are now doing digital content. Can you speak a little bit to that whole experience sure. and where yeah, it is well, today? Well, we started as a B2B business, right? We were, we were B2B only for, geez, I don't know, maybe our first 10 years. Um, I think this is our technically our 17th year in the market. Um, and we, uh, for maybe 12 of that, all we sold to was gyms, trainers, coaches, and athletic facilities. I mean, that was it. We didn't sell really any. The first time we started selling to consumers was when Amazon converted from books only to books plus. We were one of the first waves of plus. You know, we threw our 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 one product at the time, our our suspension trainer, in into that channel just so that the clients of trainers and the athletes of coaches could have a place where they could go buy a set of straps, right? And so um, we really became an education company very early because trainers and coaches, you know, won't use something they're not comfortable with, with their clients and their athletes. And so we created a professional education curricula that showed fitness pros how to use those straps to achieve all kinds of different outcomes from rehabilitative to high performance, right? And everywhere in between. Um, then about... I guess five, six years ago, we got serious. We decided, all right, it's time for us to go after, you know, the, the larger consumer market direct. And we obviously continue to support all of our partners in the club and, and athletics spaces, but we, we wanted to be, you know, able to go straight to the customer as well. And we broadened our product line, you know, over, as I was mentioning, over the last 10 years, we really went from a one one trick pony, which was the suspension trainer. It's a pretty damn good pony. So we were able to ride a long way on it, but we wanted to, you know, we had, frankly, we had a lot of our, our commercial customers coming to us going, Hey, you now do education around all these tools that you don't make. Why don't you just make those tools? And if you do, we'll buy them. And at that point, you know, I said, all right, well, if you promise, then we'll make them. And so, so we did. So that led us into a path where we had a broader product line. We had had built a lot of content to support our products with the end users. And we made the decision that, all right, it's time to, to go after the direct consumer business as well. And then we you know built out a big expensive website and started uh, doing the things that, you know, aspiring consumer brands do. Um, and now we're, you know, five or six years down that path. And we really, um, with COVID having hit, you know, that, that's been an interesting experience because what had been maybe a 50-50 business between commercial and consumer swung way over to the consumer side, obviously, as clubs had to close, trainers were put out of work. And um, so, you know, the bulk of our focus for the last year has been on the direct consumer side and making sure that the gear that we sell people they have lots of opportunities to get content and coaching that can help them be successful in whatever their goal is, whether it's, you know, getting back in shape or, you know, we, we got, I can't tell you the number of Olympians and, you know, pro athletes that we have in every sport, whether they want to be at the, you know, the peak of their, of their physical abilities. And we meet you where you are and hopefully help you get where you want to go. Amazing. It's been cool to see these companies, whether it's uh, TRX, we just launched a partnership today with Hyperice. Um, I know Whoop, which I'm trying right now, has gone have gone to like professional athletes. And then it's sort of been like a trickle down in terms of like consumerizing those products a little bit uh, more. I'm curious as you as you think about and have like studied and reflected on the arc of TRX from a B2B business for the first 10 years to being more of a consumer driven uh, company. Is there anything that you would have done um, as a founder? And I think now you're the chairman differently in terms of how you would have operated and scaled the business. Um, I'm sure like sometimes you look back and there's like lessons learned. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Hey, I've learned a lot more, but I've, I've made a lot more mistakes than I made great decisions. Fortunately, none of the mistakes were terminal. But, um, you know, I think that's how you, that's how you become, you know, good. And I don't know that I'm there yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. 
and you know you make a lot of mistakes hopefully none of them kill you and you learn from them and so so you know one of the things that i think in retrospect i should have done was move to consumer sooner um you know we we really we had a great high growth business with pros and um so we served that for a long time but i think that we we could have served consumers much earlier in our evolution um the technology you know wasn't as good six or seven years ago as it is today and that was one of the obstacles in reaching the consumer is you have to have a good scalable content and in you know entertainment system basically to be able to sell people fitness gear because if i sell you a kettlebell and you have no idea what to do with it then it ends up being nothing more than you know collecting dust in your closet or it's holding down you know the your floor mat out in front of your front door if i if i can take that piece of equipment wrap it in content of a variety of flavors so you find the flavor that you know that fits your interest then i make i turn that hunk of lead or hunk of steel rather into a living product that that can be what it is you need it to be and so you know i i kind of wish that we had moved a bit sooner into building out our digital delivery systems and and going after um, consumers at home only because it would have allowed us to reach a lot more people, you know, sooner, do a lot more good and, and, you know, make, uh, make more money as a company. Totally. And I've spoken to some of these other companies that are now in like the connected fitness space. And although they have this connected hardware, they oftentimes they refer to themselves as, you know, content companies, um, which I, I find interesting. Uh, I'd love to zoom out a little bit on you, uh, Mr. Hetrick. Mr. Randy, as yeah, please, as a, my dad, Mr. Hedges, <laughs> my father, uh, so as a wellness enthusiast, and you know, I mentioned some of these connected fitness companies. Um, you're a fit guy. I know you do things like surf, um, which are probably nice and like a little bit less tech. How how do you, as an enthusiast and as someone who's, I don't know, I, I look at you as the the top of your game. Think about things like. Uh, tracking your heart rate or tracking your, I don't know, just tracking things digitally. Is that a focus for you? And then maybe even zooming out a little bit more, what do you do um, to make sure that you're feeling healthy, fit, and so you can give um, everything to you can to your company? Well, I think your assessment of me being on top of my game is probably too kind by half because I work too much to be on top of my game. That that would be my first piece of advice. Work less, work out more. Uh, and, and I'm working on figuring out how to do that. But but you know, I mean, I, I just turned 55 and I feel very fortunate that, you know, I can still bring it pretty much as I ever could. Um, I need more recovery time between episodes and I need better warm-ups because the one thing I've really learned is uh, how how old are you, John? 28. Yeah, you pup. So <laughs> what you will discover about 10 years from now is that the body becomes much less forgiving of quick starts, right? You, you really do need the elasticity in your tissues and in, and in your muscle fibers goes down and the rigidity goes up. And so you need to do a lot more deliberate warming up. I do a lot of like lower leg myofascial massage to, mm. to try to keep my calves and Achilles you know, in, in working order, my hamstrings, because those really, for me, have been three of the areas that as I've aged, I've noticed the pliability in, in you know, the posterior, the back of my leg, from my kind of hips down to my heels, just requires more care and feeding to, to keep it from getting injured. And when you get injured, then you're screwed, because now you're not, you know, now you're going backwards, not forward. Um, so, those are some of the things that that as time as I've evolved, I've I've had to de devote more time into tissue prep, you know, uh, and and post workout warm downs, rub downs, uh, you know, and the like. And I do a lot more stretching and and yoga than I used to. But um, with to your question about tracking, you know, I'm it's interesting because I do it, but I'm also a critic of, of 
myself, my, my company and my industry that we haven't done a better job yet making the metrics that get gathered by wearables relevant, right? Mm. And by that, I mean, making them prescriptive in nature, making them anything other than, than an observation of something you did. Because most of us, you know, I get the same charge, I'll do a big, heavy, you know, hard concept to rowing piece, right? And I'll, and I'll track my heart rate. And at the end of it, you know, I go, oh, yeah, look, right? Look, look, look what I did. It's entertaining, but it's not especially useful, right? Yeah. And, and it takes a lot of work to make metrics useful because you have to do a lot of tracking and benchmarking and most people don't like to do that. So most people wear their, wear their wearable, do their thing, look at it, get a little sense of accomplishment and move on. Right. And, and I think that where, where the industry is headed and eventually we will get there is toward making those biometrics that you track prescriptive in what you do tomorrow. And I think that when we get to that point, right, companies like Whoop and, you know, Wahoo and, and the, the Garmin, the folks that are, that are making devices will, will realize a renaissance um, in sales that hasn't happened yet. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, just to piggyback off some of what you said, like my real strong investment into fitness from like strength training has been in yoga. And I feel like as a yogi, you're like, you want that intuitive sense of, I feel at peace. I feel strong. I, you know, I feel good. And you don't need any of the digital numbers in order to like be that, that reflection of that. But as I've kind of gotten back into being surrounded by these companies, um, I've been curious about it and I can talk about my experience with something like Strava, which I'll like, I'll track my rides, I'll post my rides, but I'll never go back and look at them like it's it's really just like share them with my friends and be like oh look I did a 60 mile ride what I'll say about whoop that I've liked so far in my experience is that it will come back to me and say hey today's a recovery day or you didn't sleep that well last night take it easy or it'll it'll come back and say hey you're fully recovered go hard today um, so yeah I, I, I'm curious also about the the future of this space um as a whole and that's that's what gets me excited well, being around what it. you just mentioned is is heading in the direction and i think it's why whoop's doing very well relative to some of the, some of its competitors is they're they're beginning to to shift toward a prescriptive nature right they're telling you hey you didn't sleep that well so i'm going to prescribe a different program for you today which is to take it easy yeah. So, so, you know, as, as I think that that approach evolves, it'll get better and better and better. And, you know, we're working on a, some, some integration of smart technology into our products that will help gather the, the, the metrics that you need to then create, you know, a, a, um, essentially a dashboard that tells you where to go. And, um, and I think when we get there, it'll be, it'll be really valuable. And when you can, you know, log in injuries and have, have your, your technology then give you a rehab protocol, you know, some things that are yeah. that really, it becomes more of a living brain rather than, than just a library of what you did. Totally. Uh, one question I like to ask is what is the most unique or out there thing that you do in order to, mm -hmm. other than drink LaCroix, it, to, to feel well. The most unique or out there. Well, <clears throat> one thing I like to do that, that's, that, I don't know, some people find odd, I'll, I'll put it that way. I like to go out one or two days a week, I go out to my garage and I've got it basically set up as a fight gym. And I go out there and I, you know, put on a UFC fight. So I've got some technical stuff going on. I set up my, you know, my Tabata timer, my interval timer, and I just go and beat the hell out of, you know, I got a, I got a big heavy teardrop bag. I got a speed bag. I got a double ended bag. And, and then I, I skip rope and shadow box. And so I sort of let my, you know, my aging warrior, uh, come out to play, uh, persona come out to play. And that, that's a little odd. I think the neighbors find it odd to hear me in there you know, grunting and pounding things and everything's shaking. And the, 
the speed bag is doing it, you know, it's, it's a, that's a little odd. Um, beyond that, you know, I'm a, I kind of like to use exercise as meditation because I can't meditate to save my life. I try, but I'm just not there yet. You know, my brain, it just goes and I can't let it just go. So I have to follow it. And, and next thing you know, I'm solving, you know, every vexing problem that exists in my life instead of being peaceful and, and free, letting my mind wander. So I use exercise and distraction in order to achieve that. So if I'm on the concept two, I watch fights because I was a jujitsu guy, you know, all the coming all the way up. And it's very technical if you know what to look for. So it's like watching chess players, right? If you don't mm. know chess, you go, what the hell is that? But if you're a good chess player, you could probably watch chess all day or poker players, right? People who are good at poker, they can watch the poker channel. Whereas, you know, the rest of us look at it and be like, how boring to watch a bunch of dudes sit around and play cards. So, so those kind of, I like to have one of those activities on a screen while I'm doing something very challenging physically. And that for me is, is the unlock to liberate my brain from doing what it otherwise does, which is, you know, just agonize over business every minute of the day. Yeah. What, what got you to go and go out and become a Navy SEAL? Like, what do you think it was within yourself? Is it, is it a competitive nature? Is it, is it the athlete? Is, is it wanting to like the entrepreneur? What, I think what it was, was little, it that got you to, yeah. It's a little of each of those things. I mean, I think I probably had a chip on my shoulder. You know, my dad was a tough character when I was growing up and had, came from the old school of kind of knock him down to make him stronger. So I had, you know, I, I don't know, I had something to prove, I think, to myself and to him and to, you know, by proxy, anyone else who was around. So there was that. I, I, I came up during the Reagan revolution, right? It's where service was, national service was, become, was being celebrated. And um, so I thought that was something that I should go and do as a patriot. And, um, and I kind of pushed those things together in military service in a unit that had the highest attrition during selection. That was my bizarre selection criteria for picking where I went to, to serve. And the SEAL teams had about an 85% washout rate during selection. So I was like, ah, that's the one. And, um, and, and you know, I, I went into it, uh, kind of everybody who does, who goes into that has to come from a pretty strong athletic background, because if you don't have the the physical gifts won't get you there, but without them, you won't get there, right? So it's, it's a combination of having, having you know, a, a reasonably high level of physical uh, performance coupled with just a, you know, a head made of rocks when it comes to uh, stubbornness. You just won't quit. And, and you, you put those two together and, you know, you, you do pretty well usually during training. And so I made it through and you know, had a, had a pretty incredible career. I know we're going a little off script, but I'm, I'm just going to keep exploring my curiosity um, and, and also be respectful of your time, being respectful of your time. In terms of like that, being on that edge and being under that pressure, and I'm sure that happened a lot as you were training as a Navy SEAL, but then fast tracking that to like entrepreneurship and building TRX, are there any moments you recall that were somewhat inflection points for you where, you know, was your back was against the wall and you had to kind of tap into that, uh, that reservoir of strength and resilience in order to then be able to, I don't know, keep calm or not keep calm and carry on? Yeah, I think almost it's every day as an entrepreneur, you know, it's like... <laughs> As, as an entrepreneur, I mean, entrepreneurship is not for the meek, right? Uh, it's, it's one of those things that only screwballs do. And, and you got to have a certain amount of, of uh, you know, a depth of resourcefulness, a high tolerance for risk, and you got to have kind of a screw loose to want to become an entrepreneur. And, and that's just a, it's just a reality. And so, that the, being a SEAL was perfect training for that. And, and the SEAL culture, which, which people don't necessarily know, is incredibly entrepreneurial. I mean, it's, it, it's bred into SEALs. I think it's selected to begin with. You, you, you attract inherently entrepreneurial cats, but then 
that raw material gets gets molded and there's a deep vein of entrepreneurship that runs through the seal culture which is how do i make things better tomorrow right than what i see today better from a technology perspective better for a standard operating procedures perspective better from a physical performance from a tactical you know and st strategic performance uh, perspective all of those things are kind of part of seals are agitators they they are and people will, will people will say less less generously pains in the asses right they they are they are the cats that are always pushing 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 and wanting to know why why do we do it this way well, there's a better way why don't we do it that way right i mean they're they're hell to lead myself included because they're just a, you know they're they're there's an element of prima donna to the culture but i would say it's 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 misread when you hear people talk about you know seals and other special operators as prima donnas i think it's more they're very entrepreneurial and never satisfied, right? They're mm -hmm. never satisfied with the status quo. So that was all pretty good. I mean, you know, you're an entrepreneur. That probably sounds pretty familiar with with uh, the things that build good entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of uh, craziness in there. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that's actually a perfect segue to something that you mentioned in that answer, which was is around leadership. So how do you balance something like you know wanting to push the people around you to, to oh sorry that always happens sometimes it you logs me out of zoom it logs me out of zoom and i'm like oh shit the call go <laughs> so how do you balance you know wanting the people around you to be better and then some of the stuff that we're talking about at june which is around wanting your people to feel taken care of and supported and doing something like as a wellness company promoting people to not work too hard to work but not to work too hard and to, to also to take care of themselves in order to then be able to show up day in and day out so i guess the question is around like leadership and it, and how do you promote that employee well-being internally and kind of balance those two well i mean look i would caveat it by saying you know i'm no expert in leadership i am a student of leadership and you know i've got a lot of years in leadership roles but that does not mean that I'm the master. It just means that I'm, you know, a, a aspirational student of the craft. And I would say that for, you know, a number of years, I probably didn't do that balance very well. I, um, you know, I came from, you know, eight years at the counter terror unit and uh, you've got like the hardest charging, most capable human beings that may have ever walked across the face of the earth. When you come out from leading squadrons of those kind of people into you know, your average civilian workforce, you have a very different set of cats. Let me put it that way, right? And, and really it maps to the level of dedication and uh, sort of self-sacrifice that people are willing to endure in uniform vastly exceeds what people are willing to endure for the most part in their, their job, right? In the mm. And, and that's a little different for the entrepreneurs that found those companies, but that's because they have, they're so invested in it. They have such large stakes in the businesses, you know, the businesses are them. So they're willing to suffer and they're willing to, you know, to just keep going when, when, you know, all hope seems to be lost. Folks that come in for a job, they generally aren't willing to commit at that level, right? They have, it's a job. They have other priorities. They got families and, and they're not wrong. And it took me a long time to understand that they're not wrong. They're just different, mm. right? They're just different. And, and everybody's got a perspective and, and, you know, nobody's got the market cornered on, you know, righteousness. Um, and so, so I think that one of the things I had to learn was not to um, project my level of fanaticism about this business onto my teams, some people share that level of fanaticism because that's how they're wired. Most don't. And it took mm -hmm. me a while to, to kind of, I would say there was probably some, you know, employees that, you know, all the way up until who knows, maybe today, but certainly a few years ago, who would have said, you know, yeah, he's a pretty hard driving, like pain in the butt sometimes. And, you know, as the years go by and the experiences add, you, you soften a bit and you, you know, you learn to, to be because at the end of the day it's all about getting the best performance out of your out of your teammates that you can 
you know, help them find. And, and it doesn't do to beat people over the head when a back rub, you know, gets better performance, right? And, and, and or a great workout. Amen. A great workout is something that we have done well the entire time. You know, we've had the wellness of, of the folks at TRX is, is very well supported um, from an exercise standpoint, from, uh, you know, I think of benefits and, and now we have a, a very family friendly focus. We've become a virtual company right during, during the pandemic, we, our lease was up in our headquarters. And so we decided, well, you know, if we're ever going to try this brave new game of virtual workforce, why not now? <laughs> So, so we did, and we've managed to, even though, you know, the training center that, that all of our employees used to have free reign to do work out whenever they wanted, um, we've had to convert that into virtual. So now we do virtual classes and everybody has, you know, complete access to the virtual classes free of charge. And, you know, we've always had physical wellness as a, as a priority, and we've always respected it and given it its, you know, its fair time and, um, you know, celebrated the people who, who lead the charge on that. Um, and I think we're getting to be a pretty, a pretty, um, friendly place to work as well. You know, we, we we've mellowed a little bit. We're very inclusive. Like that's been a big initiative because that's something I did learn in the teams. And, uh, and, you know, we, we've done, a, I think a very good job at becoming better every year. Um, in, in being a friendlier, you know, more fun place to work. I love it. Well, Randy, I'm so grateful that you took the time. I think you're awesome. I think TRX is awesome. The first time I saw you speak, I think like five years ago um, in New York, I was like, who is this guy? What is he on? What is TRX? <laughs> What's he on? I, 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 I want some of that. And um, I'm, I'm thankful for you coming and sharing that wisdom that June um, with our community. Um, I'm really excited. I'd love to end the conversation seeing one, if you have anything else you'd like to share or, uh, you know, leave us with. And two, I'm really curious, what is your favorite move on this thing? Uh, and, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, so, so, so my only, my, my only, I guess, additional thing that I would offer is yeah. that it's really true. It sounds cliche, right? Especially coming from a, from a former Navy SEAL that, in every crisis, there's opportunity, but there really is. And, and it's, I mean, it, in every context of my life and every decade that I've lived, I've seen it, you know, crises like this offer opportunities to reposition, to build new, you know, new competencies that take you into the next generation of, of your business opportunities. So this moment is one that, you know, and, and it will exist for a while, I'm, I'm afraid to say that even though, you know, we hope to have a vaccine soon, people's behaviors have changed, the market has changed, the workplace has changed. There's a lot of new opportunities. And I think June, you know, I like what you guys are doing uh, to, to capitalize on one of those. And I think that, that that's just a piece of advice that, that I'm trying to live and that I would offer to everybody is don't, don't get down and feel like, you know, oh man, all my progress was lost. My future is unclear. And, you know, I just want to curl up in a ball and cry, like sit back, go, all right, well, what are the new opportunities? Where could I change and be better, you know, on the other side of this thing that I was going in and then focus on a couple of them and go. Um, that's, that's the only piece of advice that I would give. And we've certainly done that in the digital realm at TRX. We are, pouring, we are pouring gas to the fire in terms of, of developing and perfecting our digital delivery capabilities in both live and virtual, you know, and video on demand. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And I think, I think wellness and fitness is such a part of it. And, and one of the things that I love about TRX is that it's accessible. It doesn't break the bank to have one of these in your house. And especially if your employer's helping you pay for it, then there you, you go. Know, hey, a, we can then connect spots, right? Yeah. Yeah, then it's a then it's a no brainer. And then in terms of your favorite move, favorite on this move? Thing, oh, yeah. I, you know, I like so many, but I, I guess my desert island move, you know, if it was the one move I could do on a desert island for the rest of my life, would still probably be the the TRX burpee. And okay. And so the way you do that is is you take 
you take the two, you know, you adjust the handles down so that, so that the handle falls just below your knee, right? So you'd adjust it all the way down. And then you put one foot in both of the foot cradles and you basically start by doing a rear lunge, but as you lunge back, your foot is in the air. So when it gets back behind you, you then bend, put your hands on the ground, lift the other leg, do a push up. Oh, wow. And then pop back up. So it's a one legged burpee effectively with the other leg in both, both foot cradles. That, it, when you think about, and you got to do each side, right? So you got to do 10 on one side and then 10 on the other side. But, but it, when you think about everything that's involved there, it's head to toe, right? It's, it's literally, you know, you've got, you've got your push, you've got your plank, you've yeah. got a hinge, you've got a lunge and a squat, and you're working, you know, one leg at a time, which means that all your balance and stabilizers have to fire. So that's probably the one that if you forced me to just do one, that would be it. So Randy, I might take this one offline, but I, and I might completely embarrass myself, but <laughs> I've only been able to do upper body stuff because I, maybe it's just because of how I've done this, but I don't, I can't take this below where it is right now. You got it hung too high. So, so okay. that the loop, you know, the, the loop in the center where you look at where it, where it bends back on itself. Yeah. That should be at six feet. So you just need mm. to use, you probably have it snapped into your anchor point, right? Yes. Yeah, I do. You're missing, you're missing the suspension anchor that it came with. So, so go okay. get the suspension anchor. And <laughs> drop. See, it's a good thing we did this, John. You'd only been doing rows and, uh, you know, curls for, the, for your whole life. <laughs> now, the no, coolest wonder, stuff, no wonder my lower body is just. It's just mush. Hey, man, the bet the coolest things on that on those straps are are the when I think when your toes and your heels are in the foot cradles. So okay. so you gotta you gotta experience that. But you could where it's where it's there right there. You could be doing pistol squats and and reverse lunges, what we call yeah, back lunges, and those yeah, are great great for your lower body. You know, incredible exercises for your hamstrings, your your glutes, and your and your quads. Um, okay. So we'll have to get you to one of our one of our courses, so that okay, we. Uh, <laughs> but but if you but if you get a chance, go. We're you know we're running uh, our lot our TRX Live direct consumer service is going to be free for, you know the next I don't know while few months as we as we perfect it, and so if you go to trxtraining.com forward slash live, you can you can jump Perfect. into classes and you get trained by a trainer with a group for free. That's incredible. So. Amazing. Randy, this has been so much fun. Thank you. Um, and uh, excited to share TRX with our community and uh, maybe do a part two when I fix my straps. There you go. We're going to come back and check out that, that the way you have to do the burpee or not. Please All right. Man, well, thanks. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you so much.